Hello, I'm Mike Bo Swords, and today I'm going to be talking to you about rapiers. Specifically, this is a response to Matt Easton's video, and rather the commenters in that video. As Matt Easton pointed out in his excellent but rather long video, rapiers can cut and rapiers can also not cut, depending on the blade design. This video exists to clarify that rapiers, even if they have square or hexagonal section blades, with or without fullers, are still rapiers, and there's a very simple reason for that. The main typology used when discussing rapiers is the AVB Norman typology, and this typology uses hilt designs in order to categorise swords. Most people who see this sword, who won't just call it a sword, will recognise that it is a side sword. This side sword has a very broad blade. It does, however, have an extremely developed hilt. As a result, this is probably more accurate to be called a rapier hilted side sword, or even just a rapier, if you're going by something like the AVB Norman typology. Because all of our typologies have been developed in the modern era rather than in the period where these swords were made, it's very difficult to say whether something like this is one or the other. As you can see, this is clearly a sword which can both cut and thrust. At the point of percussion, the blade is still very broad, and yet the point is still relatively pointy. On the other end of the spectrum, we have swords like this, which are more typical of a rapier. This example is both shorter and has a smaller guard than most originals, because it's 19th century, but the blade has a fairly typical breadth for what you'd expect of a rapier. This rapier has two edges and is relatively narrow. An original rapier with a blade like this would have been capable of both cutting and thrusting, and this is what you'd expect of a prototypical rapier. There is, however, a third class of rapier, and this is the style which has either hexagonal, square, or diamond cross-sections. Many of the hexagonal blades will also be fullered, but this is irrelevant to the point that their edge angles are so obtuse that they are incapable of producing something like even a draw or push cut. Even producing a swift cut to any part of the body covered by even a simple shirt will not produce a cut on the flesh itself. These swords were extremely specialised to the thrust, and in fact most of them had extremely developed hilts as a result. Because you're expecting to face someone with a relatively similar sword to yours, the extremely developed hilt of these late era cup hilts and tazas meant that you'd protect your hand against the vicious thrusts that these thrust-centric swords delivered. We also see some of the longest rapiers ever made using this sort of blade geometry, which indicates the philosophy behind that blade design. By going for very narrow but very thick blade, often having around a one centimetre thick blade at the ricasso, distally tapering down to around four or five millimetres, you retained maximum stiffness while minimising weight per length. Doing so, you could make a very long sword that was still extremely stiff, and this allowed you to have the sword of the ultimate compromise between reach and weight. I don't own one of these, because I'm not incredibly rich, and they are rather expensive. But nonetheless, they do exist, as the multiple museum examples I've had scrolling across the screen can attest to. This has been a quick video by Ipo Swords responding to Matt Easton, just to say that yes, indeed, some rapiers cannot cut, and just because a rapier has a diamond or hexagonal blade doesn't mean it's not a rapier. In general, we classify them by the hilt. That's all I've got for you today. Until next time, stay sharp.